So thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm actually defending my master's thesis on Monday the 18th, but instead of giving you a semi-boring practice defense talk, I decided to use the next 30 minutes to be a little bit provocative and just talk about my research in general. Um, so one of the points that I'd like to drive home today is that the decisions that you make every day matter. The, the things that you decide to eat and do impact the global environment. And I think this is often the case when we talk about uh, our impact on the environment and the environment in general, that it seems to be something separate from us. And in the very word nature means outside of human influence, but we have a huge impact on the environment, as I'm sure many people here at the Institute on the Environment know. And so I want to illustrate how diet preferences actually have a big impact on the global environment and the global agricultural system. So for my thesis, um, one of the things that I looked into is the global agricultural system in the big picture and how global diet preferences impact the productivity of croplands. And when I talk about productivity, I mean how many people are we actually feeding with current croplands. And another thing that I have investigated is how small changes in diet preferences, how um, just switching from different kinds of meat can actually reduce our environmental impact and reduce our, um, reduce our impact on the global agricultural system. So that's something that I'll talk about as well. So, but talking about my research with other people can be awkward at times because food is a very personal thing. Um, the choices that we make about what we eat is uh, very much a cultural thing. It has a lot to do with our background, our traditions. Um, you know, and so my job as a scientist is to not to prescribe different diets, but rather to describe the impacts of different kinds of diet preferences. So when we make certain decisions, what impacts are those decisions having on the global environment? Because currently we're living in a world in which a lot of people are getting richer. And um, as incomes increase, people typically shift their diets from one that contains a lot of basic starches and grains and vegetables to one that contains more animal products. And so currently about three to four billion people in the world are entering this global middle class and increasing their per capita incomes. So as they do that, their diet changes. And research here at the University of Minnesota shows this trend. Uh, this is a figure from a recent Tillman paper showing that as incomes increase on the x-axis, per, uh, per capita calorie demand per day increases. So you might be noticing that on this figure, the y-axis goes up to 9,000 calories. And you might be thinking to yourself, who eats 9,000 calories a day? That's a lot of calories. But it's not that we're eating those calories directly, being in th this top economic group up here, but rather we demand those calories of croplands because we eat a lot of animal products. And the production of animal products requires a lot of calories. Also, increasingly, we're directing a higher proportion of the calories that we produce on croplands to produce uh, biofuels. Um, corn in the United States as well as sugarcane in Brazil is being directed to uh, produce these biofuels. So now that we know not all of what we grow um, is used for food for direct human consumption, we wanted to answer the question, how much of what we produce on croplands becomes food or how much food can we get from croplands? If the, one of the purposes of agriculture is to feed people. Shouldn't that be a metric that we quantify? How many people can we feed with croplands? So in order to do this, we investigated how different crops are used. So for this study, we looked at 41 major crops, which are, um, represent over 90% of the calories uh, produced on croplands. And we looked at how they were used. And what we found is that 55% of calories produced on croplands are used for food. 36% are directed to animal feed, and this is globally. And 9% is used for biofuels and other uses. So 
So we can figure out from these numbers what proportion of all of the calories we produce actually become food. And the math is really easy for this. So you don't need a PhD. If we take the 36% of the calories going to feed, and we multiply that by how many calories we get back in terms of meat and dairy, it's roughly 12%. So if we multiply 36% by 12%, we get about 4%. So of all of the calories that we produce, we can figure out the proportion that becomes food by adding the food proportion, 55%, to the 4% that we get in meat and dairy. So 59% of all of the calories we produce on global croplands actually become food. And it's worth noting that these numbers are for the year 2000, so the 9% going to biofuels and other uses is a little dated considering um, biofuel production has increased dramatically in recent years. Um, for example, in the United States, corn ethanol production in the, um, used to occupy 6% uh, in the year 2000 of, of, uh, crop production, of corn production. Currently, uh, for over 40% of all corn production is directed to produce corn ethanol. So there's been a huge shift towards um, directing crops towards biofuels. So if we look at um, the major uh, calorie producing crops globally, we can figure out if we ate everything that we grew, if we, can, we were able to consume all of the calories produced on croplands, which would mean that we would have to be vegan and we would stop producing biofuels from human edible feedstocks. This is how many people the um, crops could, could feed. So uh, corn or maize is a very productive crop. It produces a lot of calories globally. But when you look at how these different crops are used and what fraction of those calories actually become food, we find that corn only feeds about a quarter of the people that it could be feeding. And rice and wheat actually contribute more calories to the human diet than corn does. So these, these delivered calories include the meat and dairy calories that have been converted from the raw crop calories. And these, um, these calories that are lost are lost predominantly in the plant to animal conversion process, but also a small <coughs> fraction in the year 2000 was being directed to biofuels. So we can look at, um, we can look at this uh, relationship spatially as well. We can look at the proportion of calories that actually become food on um, the, the croplands of the world. So this figure shows um, the green areas are where a high proportion of the calories we produce become food, and the red areas are where only a small proportion of the calories that we produce actually become food. So as you can see, there's a lot of spatial variation here. Uh, India is, is mostly green, whereas Midwest of the United States is red. Some places in Brazil, just kind of, uh, you know, there's a lot of variance in there. But if we look at different uh, countries, we can figure out what proportion of the calories that they're producing actually becomes food. So in China, for example, uh, in the year 2000, only 33% of the calories that they're producing go to animals for feed. <clears throat> so most of the calories that they're producing become food. Whereas in the United States, over two-thirds of the calories that we produce on croplands in the United States, or 67%, are used for animal feed. It's important to note that most of this animal feed we're consuming here in the United States, but some of it um, something like 10 to 20 percent, depending on the year, is being exported for other countries to use as feed as well, because we're a, a top feed producing country. But regardless of who's consuming them, only 34 percent of the calories that we produce on croplands become food because most of it has to be converted to animal products. So that's a pretty startling number considering the fact that we have a very productive agricultural system here in the US. We produce a lot of calories from croplands. So if we translate these results to figuring out, OK, now we know how much food we're producing. Let's talk about how many actual people we're feeding with croplands. This is the possible calorie supply. Again, if we ate everything that we grew, we were vegans and we stopped producing um, uh, biofuels from crops. 
in the year 2000, we could feed 10 people per hectare. And it just so happens that in this year, there are about a billion hectares of agricultural land in these 41 major crops. So that's about 10 billion people fed, in theory, uh, in the year 2000, if we were to eat everything that we grew and there was no waste, et cetera. But then we can look at the actual food supply once you convert plants to animals and take out the biofuels. And we find that the number of people that were able to feed per hectare is only 60% of that, 59% of that. So we're only able to feed about six people per hectare or about six billion people in the year 2000, which was about the population of the world in the year 2000. Although these numbers do not include uh, you know, post-retail waste or household waste that you throw away. So that could take an additional 30% off of this number too, depending on the country that you're in. So when we look at different countries and how well they're doing in terms of feeding people, we find that we, you know, our croplands are very productive here in the United States. Um, but if you look at how many people we're feeding on the actual food supply, it's about 5.4 people per hectare, which is less than the global average of six people per hectare. And places like India and China are actually doing slightly better than us at feeding more people per hectare because they're growing more food crops. And so there's huge potential here in, in being able to use our croplands more efficiently by being able to feed more people per hectare. And we find that, you know, when we talk about um, trying to sustainably feed a growing population, we need to think about how we're using the land that's currently under cultivation because a lot of land expansion in the 80s and 90s has been the result of tropical deforestation in the Amazon. This is deforestation that happened between 1975 and 2003. And also a lot of deforestation happened in Indonesia and uh, Malaysia as well. So how we're using our croplands is very important. And when we look at the, the food that we're getting from this deforestation, we're actually not getting a lot of food from this deforestation because a lot of um, deforestation in, in the Amazon, at least, is, um, you know, is a, has been slashed and burned, and then it becomes uh, pasture land for beef cattle, and then later it becomes typically um, soybeans if it's not first converted to soybeans. And so that soybean production in, um, in the Amazon, we can see that we're not getting <clears throat> many calories per calorie produced because most of those soybeans are being used for animal feed. Uh, most of those soybeans are exported to China to meet their increasing demand for animal products, especially pork. So if we look at all of the calories that we could get possibly from um, current croplands, we find that if we shifted all of the calories that are going to different uses currently to all food for human consumption, we could increase calorie availability by 70%, which is a lot of calories. In fact, it's enough calories to feed about 4 billion people. But that would require that we were all to become vegan and we were all to stop producing biofuels, that huge policy changes and in the renewable fuel standard took place, and that's, that's probably not going to happen in the uh, recent, or, you know, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So I want to talk about how we can make small changes in our diets. Um, you know, it's, I think often when I, when I talk about this, and, and sometimes when I talk about my research with my family, they think that, you know, I'm talking about just eradicating all animal products from your life and, and while reducing animal products will reduce your impact on the environment, like I said, I'm not prescribing different diet preferences. You have to make decisions about what you want to eat based on your own values, of course. But, you know, we can make small changes, almost unnoticeable changes in our diets that have, uh, that can reduce, significantly reduce our environmental impact. So for my second paper of my thesis, I've been working with a health insurance company. And this health insurance company is international, but for this study, I'm going to be sharing results of a study that they did in South Africa, looking at um, uh, 
subsidizing healthy foods. So you might have seen this if you're part of certain health insurance companies. They'll send you a leaflet in the mail saying, if you sign up, you'll get um, 10 to 25% back on healthy foods. And these healthy foods can be like fruits and vegetables, um, you know, whole grain things, non-fat dairy, lean protein is included, uh, so lean chicken, things like that. And so they'll send you 25% back on those healthy food purchases um, so that, you know, they're essentially paying you to eat healthier. And this has actually been brought, uh, this health insurance company is working with Humana here in the United States to subsidize the uh, healthy food purchases in uh, Walmart stores as well. So it's something that, that is kind of new, but it's, it's gaining a lot of momentum. And so you might be thinking, why would you, why would you spend money trying to you know, change people's habits and, and, and pay them to eat healthier? And one of the reasons for this is because health insurance companies are financially savvy. They wanna, they wanna reduce their bottom line and save money. And 60% and of all deaths worldwide are a result of non-communicable diseases. So these are diseases like heart disease, certain cancers, things that, uh, um, diseases that we essentially get by living the lifestyle that we do, by smoking, not exercising, or consuming foods that are, that are high in fat or, or sugar, et cetera. So these health insurance companies are subsidizing healthy foods because they think that it'll save them money. And as well as saving them money, it'll make us healthier. So they approached us saying, if we pay people to eat healthier and um, promote that they reduce the consumption of sugary foods, of processed foods, of foods that are high in fat, um, we're wondering if you can tell us if that will have an environmental impact, a, a shift in, in sort of environmental metrics. So they wanted to know if shifting from processed food towards vegetables could reduce our environmental impact. So what, we, what we're finding when we look at consumption is that when you pe pay people to eat healthier, they do indeed eat healthier. Um, it can, you can see from this figure, um, the red bars show the consumption before they join the program, and the green bars show um, the consumption after they join the program. So we're seeing from our study that people increase their fruit consumption, they increase vegetable consumption, there's a slight change in uh, cereals and dairy, and there's a very slight decrease in both pork and beef consumption. And it's not like you know, people are, are, are penalized for buying these things, but they're not subsidized for them. So it seems that when you subsidize people to eat healthier, they consume less of those like fatty meats. So let's see what kind of impact this change in consumption has on the environment. So we quantified different environmental metrics for these different food categories. Um, most of these come from the literature, and we can see that from these seven food categories, beef requires more water to produce per kilogram than any other uh, food product, that you know, animal products in general require more water than fruits and vegetables and cereals. And the same goes for land. <coughs> Especially with greenhouse gas emissions, we find that, that beef especially has about five times the greenhouse gas emissions than any other food product. So probably reducing uh, beef consumption even slightly can have a disproportionate reduction in our environmental impacts. So we can see here from this uh, crazy figure that I made that um, this figure basically shows the proportion in each food group uh, you know, from your diet. So uh, if we focus on beef for a second, beef is around 4% of a typical South African diet, but it represents over 50% of your greenhouse gas emissions, over 40% of your land, and over 40% of your water footprint. So reducing beef and pork as well can reduce these environmental metrics. 
So what we're finding is um, these small diet shifts that we're, we found in this South African study had an 8% reduction in water footprint, a 9% reduction in land, and an 11% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So we asked the question, if everyone in South Africa made this uh, reduction in beef consumption from 4.2% of their purchase weight to 3.5%, which is about a 16% decrease in beef, you know, it's like if you were eating before, if you were eating about 10 burgers a week, which is a lot, but whatever. If you were eating 10 burgers a week, you know, you switch to eating eight burgers a week. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's not noticeable and it's, it's I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it's, it's the kind of thing that people did willingly when they were, when they were subsidized to eat healthier. So, you know, and it's, it's a small relative change. It's not, it's not asking you to completely change everything that you eat. So the small 16% reduction in beef consumption, if everyone in South Africa did it, we could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 3.75 megatons of CO2 equivalent emissions. Now that's the equivalent of reducing uh, all transportation sector emissions in South Africa by 8%, or put another way, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in South Africa, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions by 1%. So this very small shift in beef and pork consumption had a disproportionate impact on our environmental metrics. So, uh, going to get a little bit uh, provocative here and, you know, just say, like I said, like my, my job isn't to tell you what to eat. It's just to describe the impacts of different diet preferences. But I've, you know, I get a decent amount of pushback on um, just, just analyzing pork versus chicken um, versus, versus beef. So, and, and some people ask the question, well, I know you did this study before about looking at where crops go and how you know, crops go to beef, and beef is a very inefficient animal. So what if I switch to grass-fed beef instead? Um, isn't, isn't that better for the environment? And while you know, having livestock in certain ecosystems can have some benefits, like um, there has been some studies finding that uh, livestock complement um, certain uh, biodiversity goals, but if we want to talk about greenhouse gas emissions, uh, an average uh, kilogram of beef produced in a mixed system, so where you graze and then feed corn later on in life, has about 56 kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions per kilogram. But if you look at um, the uh, emissions from a uh, kilogram of grazed beef, one that's just produced from whatever plants happen to be growing in that location, on average, globally, according to the FAO, it's about twice the emissions of uh, a traditionally raised uh, beef cattle. So, you know, while, while that grass-fed beef might be better because it has less, you know, fat content, et cetera, when we look at emissions, it's not better. Um, so, that sucks. <laughs> so, I hope that I sort of made the point that diets matter, that, you know, personal decisions can have a big impact on the environment. And if we, you know, want to think about sustainably feeding an increasingly affluent population with increasing demands for meat, we need to think about the choices that we make every day because they have an impact not only in the global food system, um, but, you know, the atmosphere and, and Amazon rainforests, et cetera. So I want to um, thank the Global Landscapes Initiative for support in this research, and that's all I have for today.